Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the February 13th Mount Bridges Arena Building Committee. Uh, has the roll call been taken? Oh, this is the mayor is absent this evening. Yes, he's, he's absent with notes. Uh, can I have someone make a motion to approve the agenda for today's meeting? Moved by Sandy, seconded by Greg. All in favor? It's carried. Are there any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none, uh, it's been quite a while since we've met. Uh, so has anybody, uh, does anybody have any errors or omissions from the uh, minutes of the December 11th meeting held last year? Seeing none, then I need a motion to approve those. If I grant, seconded by Mike, call in favor. You agree, Sandy? Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I love these small carries. <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, new business. So, where we left off was that uh, uh, we asked council to approve an expression of interest uh, for uh, anybody that might be willing to do a private public partnership. Uh, we have yet, I think, to receive any, but it is posted, correct? Yeah. Uh, it's, we posted it. Uh, Today we did a press release with the CBC, CTV, MyFM, The Banner, uh, the Municipal Information Network, which is a Canada-wide uh, publication, uh, as well as the Ontario Recreation Facility Association has over 5,000 members. So we'll wait and see what uh, comes back with that. But in the meantime, uh, work uh, continues on the plan that we had uh, uh, to uh, move towards having at least a shovel-ready project if uh, funding becomes available. Uh, and uh, we'll have to make a decision at some point. Uh, uh, just talking with Rob earlier that uh, as far as design work goes, can only go so far if, if we decide we're gonna put it on a different piece of property or if it's gonna go uh, where we had originally planned. Uh, but I will turn it over to Mike from A-Link and, and he can uh, give us some more educated instruction on on that process should it ever come to that point. Okay, thank you. I'm going to try to share my screen. Sorry. Go ahead. They changed the interface on Zoom, so hopefully that loads in. There we go. Okay. Perfect. So, so this is presentation number seven. Um, it's been a while since we've seen each other, so it's, it's actually good to see everybody. Sorry for the lateness. Um, so, I did listen to the last meeting, the January meeting, uh, just so I'm up to speed, because there's a whole bunch of items that were um, brought up. Um, so I've actually laid them all out um, in these presentation boards and we'll talk about everything. Again, it's an open conversation, right? So since last meeting, um, we had the public consultation on June the 20th and all the comments were provided to the uh, committee on June the 28th. Um, based off of that, uh, there has been some feedback on the design uh, which we've been working on, the schematic design. Um, honestly, though, we haven't really been working on it until this year, so it kind of went on hold for a bit because of the site analysis that occurred. I, I, we really didn't want to spend our time working on the site uh, design of the building uh, because of the analysis. So Pynchon was hired um, to do a lot of consulting reports for the existing Caradoc Community Centre parcel of land. So the ESA phase one uh, was completed and we received that on October 17th. Um, good news uh, there is you don't have to do a phase two report on the site. There's really nothing critical in that report. I'm sure all these can be provided by Rob to everyone. Um, maybe you've all read it already. Uh, the geotechnical report was also provided. So with that, um, we provided a borehole drawing. So what we've done is we have a general idea of where the building is going to go on the site based off of all our discussions. Obviously, we know where the existing building is. So we created a, a grid-like um, 
a grid across the site with boreholes and then um, Pynchon uses that to provide the borehole information. So basically soil depths and bearing and water um, elevations. Um, and so again, that's all in the report. It's, it's, a, it's a large report. So I'm not gonna go over that. Um, the findings there, nothing super critical. Uh, pretty boilerplate as for your soils within the site. Um, so nothing major of concern there that would hinder the development or change, you know, for instance, where we put the building or if we even would put a building there. Um, along with that, uh, we received a survey from AGM uh, on November 7th. So that's your legal uh, boundary survey of the Caradoc Community Center parcel. So again, using that uh, to inform the site plan because, you know, we're working on parking and you know, where the building's going, we, we want accuracy when we, when we do work. There's a few other elements that I haven't seen yet, um, but I know Pinchon was hired to do was the designated substance report for the Caradoc Community Center as well as the Tri, uh, the Tri County Arena, uh, Tri Township Arena, sorry. I always write county for some reason. Um, so I haven't seen those reports yet. Um, those are, I believe, in Rob's hands or Richard's hands right now. Also at the meeting, on January meeting, there was discussions of a tour for a comparable project. It was a Wellesley Arena that was recently constructed I believe it was 27 million for that. And it was a arena and a rec center, very comparable in its size and its capacities. So I know there was discussions of going on a tour. Uh, I don't know if this has occurred at all. You all went. It, it hasn't occurred, just didn't. It's purely based on workload of staff at the moment. Sure. To get budget I totally understand. <laughs> it is January, February. <laughs> I, I would highly recommend it. Uh, I mean, I have done some research on the building. Um, again, it's, it is a very comparable product, project, sorry, project to what we've all been talking about. So highly recommend it. And definitely, if you have the time, get your facilities team to even go out there. Um, and if you go for a tour, I would love to attend just because it is it is a most recent comparable project. You said 27 million? I believe that was the number that Rob mentioned previously um, in the January meeting. Uh, which year was that built in? Last year. Last year. It just opened. Yeah. So it's a single pad arena. Uh, it has a gymnasium, full court gym. It has community spaces. It has a walking track. Uh, it has a seating capacity, a standing capacity. It's very comparable to what we've been talking about all along. And if I remember correctly, sorry, if I remember correctly, that project sat in the planning stages for a really, really long time uh, before it finally got moved forward. And the only reason it got moved forward was it received uh, provincial and federal funding. I believe, also, oh, I believe there also was a junior team as well. Uh, I've seen the plans, so I, I believe there's a junior team that plays out of it. Again, it's very comparable, so out of everything, I think it's one that you should take a look at. So, also last meeting, there was many options discussed for the project. Um, but I'm just laying them out for you. One is continue the work that we're doing with the KDOT Community Center for see with schematic design, define the project scope in order to prepare for costing. And I'll, I'll speak to costing uh, in a later slide. Another one is do nothing and wait for the urban and growth boundary to expand um, in order to find an alternate arena location. This is the only site you've given me to work on. So what is your timeline? How long do you want to wait? So something to think about. Public-private partnerships, so Rob mentioned uh, that has started, uh, which is great. So the, the update is uh, now known to me. Another one is uh, renovate the existing Tri-Township Arena. I spelled it right that time. Um, but you'd be shutting down hockey, right, to do the renovation. So can you live without hockey in the community to fix the arena? Really, those are the options. I don't know, maybe I'm missing something, but those are the options. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, you, you've, what you've provided there is, is uh, really stuff that we've been talking about probably since this committee got together, right? Is, is what, are, what are the options? And don't want to speak uh, out of term, but the, I believe the intentions of moving forward the way we were was uh, to be ready for any grants that may, may come uh, available. 
so that, and that's how we've been proceeding. Uh, there has been all of this other conversation as well going on. Uh, so at, at some point in uh, time, uh, direction is going to be, need to be given uh, for us to either continue, stop, move forward, change directions, whatever it may be. Um, but until we get that direction, staff will continue down the path that's been uh, that we've been provided, which is to continue with the drawings and uh, schematics and, and that sort of stuff. So. Uh, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Sandy. Thank you. Uh, so just on that, I, I have not, because it was um, just built, and I have not been there, which is funny for me to say that out loud, that I haven't been to an arena. But I would love, once we're through budget, I, I think because it was built last year, because it was shovel ready, because the, the grants were, um, they, they were ready to go, but it was sitting, 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 very similar to what we have going on right now, I think it wouldn't be a bad thing for us to find uh, a couple of hours and, and to go to, go visit that. Not saying that's going to fix all our problems, but it would be interesting to see and talk to um, talk to them, see it and, and see what was done and really get an in-depth um, conversation going with um, the people that actually put that all together and how it all came together with the grants and being shovel ready, etc. I just, I mean, we're, we're kind of sitting in limbo, right? So, um, I mean, it, and I'm sure the public feels that way too. We're, you know, what are we doing? We're still using Tri Township. Obviously, it's still okay to use, um, but we haven't shut anything down. We haven't said we're not doing something. We're just, I mean, we put something out. Yeah, so for for the public, and I guess for Mike's uh, position as well, uh, <clears throat> I think I can sum it up, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but the $36 million price tag that was floated around uh, uh, kind of put the pause button on, on moving forward until maybe construction prices uh, solidify a little bit or our tax base. Uh, becomes a little bigger to, to afford that kind of price tag. But also, uh, as we go through our, our budget process, uh, uh, I think once we get through it, council as a whole will have a, a better grasp on, on where the, the big projects lay and how they're gonna be paid for and where that leaves our, our cash flow. Uh, so, you know, we've been on hold too uh, as far as discussions with, with For the Mount Bridges Arena. Uh, at the end of the day, I think the motion remains the same, is that we need to replace the arena with a nice pad. Uh, uh, it's just a matter of, of timing and uh, uh, yeah, where our finances lay to, to do that. So I, I think that's, anybody else got anything to add to that? Go ahead, Mike. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I don't disagree with what you're saying. Um, I, I might just expand upon it from my own point of view. Um, I think uh, I think proceeding to a shovel-ready process right now on this plot of land uh, is not advisable. We have urban boundary uh, going on right now, and um, so I think that's one big ball in the air. Is, is the urban boundary and, and what's that going to look like? And then we did, we, we have the, the private uh, public partnership. And I couldn't begin to imagine if anything will come back. And if it does come back, it'll be very exciting to see what a, a private partnership would look like, what, what they see the, the, the design and, and uh, the facility to be. <clears throat> because they're going to see it differently than us, completely, right? We're going to see it from a municipal. We need an arena and we want a few services in it and we only have a, so much money and they're going to be, no, no, we see it from a business point of view and we need other things there to make it uh, a business. So um, two really big balls in the air. Um, uh, the other thing I do see uh, just uh, both uh, from the county and talking to provincial uh, politicians of late. I'm not, I'm not seeing anything on the horizon where uh, grants are coming through for these type of projects. I see lots of possibilities opening up for infrastructure. 
um, and housing. That is, ev that's all the talk. Everybody I'm talking to at the provincial level and, and uh, at the county level, of course, they're talking to the provincial people. Uh, that's the big push. So um, if, if I felt that there was grant possibilities coming through in the next year or two years, you know, before the next election, I'd be more apt to say, let's get that shovel ready project. I, I personally don't see that happening. And I've, I've been watching for that type of information to flow through specifically for this conversation. Um, Tri Township is a functioning arena. It continues to function. Um, we've had that discussion at the uh, TTA board. Um, uh, there's a few minor repairs that, that may need to happen. And, and perhaps if this gets delayed uh, for some period of time because of our budget, uh, then we may, we may choose to, 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 to spruce it up a little bit and just make it uh, better looking. And, and uh, you know, I mean, there are some things that could happen down there for uh, relatively little money that, that would make it seem a little newer and a little nicer. So um, I'm not seeing why we would continue to move uh, to a shovel ready project at this time. I don't think we drop it. I think we, you know, we, we keep it on the hot plate. Um, but I think there's a few balls uh, in the air that we just need to get some answers to before we can make that decision. I guess I would, I would add that given the, uh, the nature of this topic, and how this committee came to be uh, would be that that council, not this committee, would need to provide some kind of direction as to as to where we go. But what I would like to hear from Mike is where you're at <clears throat> and what you uh, uh, could see happening uh, uh, if if uh, uh, things were were potentially coming to a pause. Or how long would you pause for? Maybe what I'm sure you've had some uh, experience with projects of this nature that that go through these same kind of dilemmas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, so I actually have lots to talk about. So again, a like we're hired by by you all, right? I work for you. I'm not just doing work for the sake of just getting billable hours out there at all. So. If you tell me to stop or we get council direction to stop, we'll stop, we'll pivot, we'll move on to the projects that happens all the time. So that can't be done. No, no feelings hurt. What we're trying to do is just help you through the process, the visioning process, figure out what you need, what you don't need, and just sort of start cutting it down. So if it gets picked up down the road, two years later, whatever years later, we at least have had the conversations um, about it. So we're just trying to whittle things down. Um, but to keep moving, because we have kept moving, on the schematic design. I, I do want to touch the point on the minimal viable product, which uh, you, you mentioned last meeting. And um, obviously that's more uh, programming and app based um, about uh, releasing a product, getting instant feedback, and then in turn informing the, the product, right? It's lean and agile methodology. So there is comparisonism into architecture and, and our process. So I, I will speak to that and hopefully this will kind of glean that kind of connectivity of what you, I think what you were making um, in January. So for us, it's a process and a product. That's what architecture is. So we're doing the process right now. Um, a part of the process is we have um, set milestones and cost estimates that occur. So we do a, a phase of work, which I'll speak to. And then at the end of that, we have a cost estimate. And that gives you an idea of scope. So there's the triangle there, scope, cost, time. That's a project, really any project that you ever do. It's those three items. How much is it gonna cost? How long is it gonna take? What are we doing? Where's it going? What's the scope? So far, all we've been really been talking about is scope. There's questions of costs. Costs have been thrown around. Nothing has been costed out yet. We're just using comparisons between other projects, which may be equivalent and maybe are not. Uh, but in the end, what we have is each phase gets costed out, and the costs help inform the decisions that we're all making for the design, right? We don't just get a cost and say, oh, great, cool. So if it's over budget, if it's under budget, do we need to make hard decisions on the scope? Something has to give. If you want the cost to go down, you gotta decrease the scope, right? That's, it's straightforward. 
Architecture really is the process to help you through that. In the end, yeah, you get a building that you get to be in and use, an arena, a community center, a library, a church. But the process itself is extremely important. So we pride ourselves on providing a really great process for everyone. Um, so what does that actually look like? Um, we're only in the front end here. <laughs> Projects take a long time. Um, again, if you, maybe you haven't gone through a project. Um, a great comparison for this really is the most recent one that we've done for your community is, is the fire hall. So schematic design is what we're doing right now. We're defining the scope of what, where, um, like where is it going, and, and that could be determined. Maybe we, we're not set on the site. Maybe it's a, a new site, but is the building itself, could it be transplanted to a, a, a site that doesn't exist yet or a site that maybe you know of that's not in the urban growth boundaries? It's programming, it's needs, it's meeting with the community, which we've done. A lot of that happens in the front end of schematic design. Um, things that we have not done yet uh, is the preliminary uh, elevations and materials and the systems, the building systems. We have ideas of what we're doing um, because we know what our main designs are and what they take, um, but it's actually getting them onto paper so then we can have a class C cost estimate. So that's the milestone there. With that, now you have an idea of what the cost is and an agreed scope because we've all been betting the scope together as we've been having these conversations. That's before we get any engineering team involved where it's going to cost more money once you get into design development, which is the next stage. So if everyone's comfortable, you move forward or you pivot and you modify the design and you move forward. And projects, it's this, this is the life cycle of projects and we understand costs are um, still a bit volatile. That being said, uh, based off of the tender results for the fire hall, uh, contractors are looking for work. So there's positives out there. Um, design development, what does that even mean? So it's actually engaging the engineering team, you have the architecture team. Um, in this project, we're going to have structural, mechanical, electrical, civil design, refrigeration, basically a rig consultant, landscape. All of these are already included in the package that we have with the municipality. We already know who all the team members are. I have not engaged any of them on this project because we will wait on that. Um, there's a whole bunch of work that happens in the middle of the project for design <coughs> development, including site plan approval, which is a development process that you need to go through. Um, at that stage, you really need to know what site you're doing this on because that's very, very site specific. Um, and at the end of that, there's another costing right at the bottom here, class B costing. So another milestone which helps us inform. And then with that, we can actually compare against the class C costing and the class B. We can say, are we in our target here? Are we under? Are we making the right decisions? And do we need to pivot? And if we do, we make the changes and then we keep moving. Um, some projects have a class A costing, which is the end of construction documentation. So construction documentation, in layman's terms, it's, it's the blueprint drawings, it's the permit drawings, right? That's what you need to create in order to get a permit, and then you need to create the drawings, which are the tender drawings that the contractor is going to bid on to provide you a cost. So that's all construction documentation. Go ahead, Rob. So I just, if, if uh, the members can remember <coughs> the fire hall, we went, we did a class C, we did a, ca a class B, and then we went to tender. We didn't do a class A. We didn't feel we needed to do a class A. We felt that the tender results would be reflective enough of, a, of the class A. So we, we skipped a step uh, in that process. But whether, we, whether you choose to do that in this process may be a different story, right? So. Yeah, and that's, so class A, again, I, I will show you the definitions. I put everything on here because I, I would love to inform you all on this. Because I throw out terms, and if you don't know the term, if you don't ask, you'd be like, what, what is this guy even talking about? I, I have the definitions here. Um, anyway, so after construction documentation, if everyone's comfortable, yes, maybe you could have a class A costing, which is basically like an 85, 90% drawing set, so it's pretty much complete. Um, you could get a cost as well. It's, it's basically a pre-tender estimate is what that would be, a class A. Um, and if everything is good, or maybe we don't, for instance, the far hall, we didn't have that process, then we go to tender, which is procurement and award, figuring out who the con constructor is, and then you actually know what the actual cost is. So you can see, basically on the right-hand side, I've shown the inputs of when we receive the cost. So the cost consultant, again, is a part of the team. Again, it's part of the package we have in the municipality. The cost consultant's already part of the team. Um, so they will take, really, all the projects we've been doing so far, and they're providing the cost estimates. 
um, if it's a washroom renovation or if it's a fire hall. They've been doing the estimates for us. Um, after that, obviously, if construction is awarded, uh, construction can start, and then you have, have your obviously your project completion. There's, that's a huge timeline uh, there. Right? It could be 18 months, it could be two years of construction. And then after that, it's actually all the operations and life cycle. The building has to live and breathe and move, and <laughs> you need the costs associated with that. So just because our work is done at project completion, um, we have to think about going forward as well. So that's a very high, high level about how the process works um, for our projects. It's really, we have inputs um, and we are at, at feedback loops. So again, I, hopefully there's some comparison to your minimal bio product, which you mentioned. Um, at least that's the closest comparison I can think of for architecture. So I've included here costing milestones because I threw around some terms. So class C estimate, it's the end of schematic design. Uh, basically, it's an elemental cost of the pieces of the project, so um, concrete, masonry, um, etc. Um, so in order to do that Class C estimate, we need to provide enough information to the cost consultants so they know what they're looking at. And we're not at, at that level yet, but we could be. Class B um, is the end of development design. This, uh, this would include, obviously, costing of the preliminary structural mechanical, electrical, all the engineering team is now involved. So the class B is much more substantive in its uh, breakdown and its estimates. Uh, so it's just a further refined costing. And then class A, if it's required, um, it's basically a pre-tender estimate. Um, and it's, as I mentioned, it's at about an 80, 85% to 90%. Um, this one, I mean, if you're doing this, uh, it gives you a good idea what the tender is going to be pre-tender, so you're not locked into making a decision with a contractor, you know, a 60-day, 90-day kind of hold on a price. So it's kind of a good as an end if you know you're going to stop somewhere. So that was kind of where you would stop for shovel ready, if I put that in quotations. You'd want to stop around there. So, <clears throat> so Mike, uh... Let me walk through this. So if, rather than going to tender, so when we went to the tender on the fire hall, uh, say that tender came in at uh, $10.8 million and we budgeted only $10 million, we would have, because the contractor in the, in the agreement or in the bid document, we have 60 days, the price is held for 60 days for council to make a decision whether to move forward or not. Are we able to, uh, during that 60 day period, we don't have the ability to adjust any of the items in the tender to reduce the price, correct? There is some mechanisms that you can do. You can do post tender addendums. You could go down to like, it depends on your procurement policy, the low bidder or maybe the, the two low bidders, get them to price out some potential scope reductions. The whole part of this exercise and why we have all this costing milestones built into our system um, is so we don't get to that stage. So that was, that was <laughs> my point, was in a, a project where we're talking about $30 million, um, Class A costing may be a worthwhile expense because if it comes in at $38 million, we can go back to the contractor or to the engineers and the architects and say, we need to find $8 million. So maybe we're not putting in a Cadillac refrigeration plant for two and a half million. Maybe we're putting in a skid package that's only a, a million, right? So it gives us a lot more time to, to flex uh, the scope uh, of the project uh, in that Class A costing. Um, that's the only reason I brought that up. Yeah, it's, it's a, that's a fantastic point um, because the, economy, the, the scale of the building, like project-wise, and just its price tag, obviously, you know, it's the 36 million. That, that's <laughs> three times, four times the cost of the fire hall budget, right? Sorry, go ahead. Yes, Greg. Uh, just as a question for where we're at now to get to this point, <clears throat> how many more hours in time would it take for that? And what's the approximate cost of that? Just so we can have an idea of what we'd spend to get from where we're at to shovel ready. 
So I would have to give a, an estimate to Rob, which then he could provide to you guys. I can't provide that on the top of my head. Um, typically, we base our rates off of a percentage of the construction costs. So really it's to figure out what the class C estimate is and then we can then determine uh, from there and the hours as well. So it's not an answer yet, but I can provide the answer to, to Rob and who can then filter out to you guys. Yep, that's a good question. But as a follow-up question to that, uh, to get to that point you would be months away, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I could show you the timeline for the fire hall. Um, how long it takes and the, um, the milestones that we met and then from there where the bar graph kind of went um, as a comparison. I think we started that project, that was about a year or so for design and drawings or so. And, and that project didn't involve a committee, right? So Correct. It was a yeah. committee of staff and we updated council as we went along. So throwing in the, in the mix of a committee structure uh, it would slow that process further down. So you're, uh, you know, it wouldn't be out of the realm, I would say probably 16 months uh, to get to a Class A costing at this point. Mm -hmm. the way we're, the way we're Cla going. Sorry. Class A, yes. Class C, which to me, that's the one you want to get to because you want to know is the scope and the cost and the alignment. Class A is that's, that's a year away. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 There's many other milestones you want to get to. As I mentioned, I'll just scroll back up. We're only living here right now. Yes. This is where we are at the top of the page. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, you said you've been continuing to work on the project. I have, yep, yeah. 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 <clears throat> so, I'll, I'll keep going if you allow me to. <laughs> please, please do let I don't know this up front because, yeah, this, this isn't like the graphics. This isn't the exciting stuff, right? But it's important. Right. So we, I think, uh, if, um, this is how I guess I'm envisioning what, what's going to happen is that uh, we're going to have to have a discussion with council shortly uh, just to see how much more we want to work on this and get council direction. But in the meantime, uh, let's hear what, what you've been working on and what you've done. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, direction would be great. Again, we, we want to take direction from you. Uh, <laughs> um, so. In order to reach that costing milestone that I mentioned, the class C costing, we have to finish up the schematic design. Uh, so since last time we met and last plan you guys have seen was the June 12th plan, uh, we have updated it since, uh, which is, uh, to me, it's exciting. Um, we also received the comments that I mentioned um, and we compiled them all on June the 28th and there's a few key items that were noted, so I've just noted them here. Increased seating and standing capacity, so more people ideally. Um, public walking track was noted a lot, um, so we've created a scheme where it's possible. Um, more activity rooms, more community rooms, more rooms for people to, to rent and use. Um, potentially a bar uh, space upstairs, like a blue line room, if you will. Um, and the amount of washroom spaces and parking spaces. Those were kind of the critical items that were noted. Obviously the site, you know, there was pros for the site and there was cons for using the Caradoc community site. So we kind of took that out for now, right? Because that's a whole other question about urban growth and location. So really the main focus was on the building itself. You'll see the site plan is very similar because it makes the most sense of where we're putting the building. The, the, the most changes came inside the building. So let's scroll down here, site plan. I'm gonna zoom in on it and slow me down if I'm going too quick for you. So you can see here is the building outline once it loads in, there we go. Uh, so the kind of teal color is the parking, uh, green is the new arena. Uh, it's basically within the footprint of the Caradoc Community Center um, and then south of that, uh, kind of taking up a good chunk of the parking. Size-wise, this is basically equivalent to the size I showed you last time. It's just a different formation with a lot more detail inside, plus all the items that we talked about. Um, it's still a dual um, entry, uh, just because the site dictates. So to your point about um, uh, whether this is the site or we find a new site, site will dictate the building, but 
it doesn't dictate the entirety of the building. Obviously, the main thing it dictates is the entry condition. Where are we entering the building? So if you have a new site, I can imagine, and it doesn't require this dual parking, and you only have parking on one side of the building, or maybe it's a couple, the entrance and the way that it is uh, designed currently would, would change. But again, there's some flexibility built into the design, as you'll see. Um, I'll talk about the floor plan in higher level detail when we get there. Other side items, um, uh, parking. So parking has been increased by about 20 spaces. Um, even though the building stayed the same size, I was actually able to get a double bank of parking. Uh, where before, it was about a half a bank of parking on this side. I've added um, a drop-off on both sides. So if you have parents swinging around, dropping their kids off, uh, you drop off, get the bags out, uh, you know, go on your day. Or even bus drop off as well for opposing team, as well as the, the Bulldogs um, if they need to pull in. Uh, but basically parking is on, we'll call it three sides. The, the main bulk of it being, we'll call it the south uh, west side of the parcel. So closest to the soccer fields. Which actually is beneficial because the amount of soccer uh, you know, parents driving for practice and games at the soccer fields. Uh, it's nice having a, a more, the, the more amount of parking, I guess, on this side, closer to using the space. Again, this is seen as not just an arena, right? I, we're talking about a rec center at this point. Um, so it's multi-season, multi-use, flexible spaces. So we have the green space, which is fantastic, and then all the other spaces inside the building. Uh, the back of the house, if you will, where refrigeration is, is still at the, the back of the building at the south. That hasn't changed. Really, the main pieces within the building haven't changed in their positioning. It's just the detailing around them um, has changed. So we're looking at about 71,000 square feet, 7,400 square feet for first floor. As I mentioned, it, it's now two, two, two floors because of the... Uh, walking track that you've asked for as well as uh, some other features upstairs. So before, if you remember, the lobby was a two-story space. Um, I believe Councillor Pelkman, you mentioned, hey, why don't we put blue line room up there? Let's look at that idea. So that's what we've looked at. But we'll start with the, the ground floor. I'm going to zoom in on it because it's a really big plan. So we'll start from the south end of the building. You come in uh, and there's a lobby area here. Um, and then adjacent to that is the reception, general office, office component. It's nice to have um, a face or something uh, when you come in the door to a facility. Um, as well as for ticketing, this could duel up for that uh, as well. Um, so it made sense to kind of place it over in this zone. Uh, the other thing we've had to add, because it is two stories, is an elevator. So you'll notice that, that is right off the lobby and there's a stair that wraps around it that takes you upstairs. Um, there's double doors here that take you into the, the cold space. So this is the environmental separation. And we have a double layer of glass. You don't get pucks um, firing off of the wall or the glass, if you will, of the viewing area or the lobby for noise. We can stick at the lobby and then we'll go over to the rink area. There's a corridor that takes you into the gymnasium. And then we have storage for the gymnasium as well. Um, there wasn't any talk of putting a divider in. If there is, we would change this around slightly. So that's a, kind of a question for your team if we need a divider, because then you wouldn't have the door in the center. Things can shift around at this uh, zone. We have a universal washroom, sort of fountain central, and then the, the, the main washroom bank here uh, as well. So keeping all the wet spaces together in the building is more efficient, and then also stacking them, as you'll see upstairs. We have a little storage room here, and then the storage room could have access off the gym as well if we needed to, or they could be merged together. Again, there's a lot of flexibility in the plan the way it is. This is just a kind of a first pass at trying to fit everything in that you've asked for. At the back end here, we have a corridor which leads to our exit stairs, uh, as well as an exit to the outside. Um, and there's also now a central door as well. So if you were going to divide the space, we could figure out a way to access both ends if you had the divider closed. Again, I don't know if you need one, so I've left it out for now. And you'll notice we have some smaller change rooms here with an in and an outdoor um, into the uh, gymnasium. So, so male, female change rooms, if they're required. 
There's a couple of offices at this uh, corner of the building because then they have access to natural light, excuse me. Um, and we have a couple other spaces upstairs as well, which can also act as offices. So these offices potentially could be for the, you know, the minor hockey office, figure skating, uh, et cetera. Um, again, there's, there's many, much flexibility built into the plan right now where things can move around. Uh, one thing you'll notice as well as I've looked at the rudimentary structure for the building, because we are doing two stories, so it's important to get at least that started in here. Uh, and that actually helped form uh, some of the layouts as well of the space. Uh, we have a kitchen, which could be the teaching kitchen. So this space, uh, as a comparison, if you know the space for the Caradoc Community Center, this is about one and a half times the size of the existing Caradoc Community Center kitchen, which I believe they use for cooking programs and stuff like that. So spatially, um, you know, it's larger. Um, it also could act as concessions. I know you don't do that now um, operationally, uh, but there is the option for that with just a roll-up shutter and ways you could kind of design that into it. So you've kind of the food zone here, if you imagine, you know, during games with a, um, a larger lounge and lobby space. Um, in this space, you could have flexible seating actually all along this window. Here, you could have flexible seating, not unlike what they do at Boswick, where people just pull up a chair. So less built-ins and more just flexible for you. On the back side of the kitchen at the corner as well, as you kind of drive into the facility, we have the multi-purpose community room. Um, so I think last time I, I mentioned this is a comparison in size for what you have at the Gemini, which is the, um, yeah, very similar size. And then off of that, we have storage, again, similarly sized. So very much comparison uh, in real projects that you could walk in and kind of look up and say, hey, is this big enough for us? Um, as a starting point, it's located over here. We have the other vestibule um, for that north parking group, because uh, it is that dual entrance. Uh, and then uh, next to that, we have another kind of bonus meeting room, community room with some storage. So again, another rentable space um, for the facility. Um, as you come in as well, you are at board height. so. It's fully barrier free accessible when you're at this viewing area. Um, so not unlike what we did at Boswick. Um, there's no ramps that you have to deal with, like at uh, Lambeth, for instance. Um, it's uh, yeah, fully accessible for everyone. So it doesn't matter how big or small you are. Um, you're able to, to see out and see through to the ice. There is a buffer here as well. Uh, you don't want to put the boards right up against um, that wall. That would be awful for the players. So there's a buffer there. That's why there's a little skinny space here. I'll zoom in further. So that's why we have these slope walkways. So they're not ramps because we're able to make uh, the uh, slope work. So we don't have to have handrails. We could put handrails, but it's not uh, considered a, a ramp or OBC because it's a longer walk. So it's more gentler slope down. So now once you're down in this, you're in theory at just above ice level, if you will, right? You still have to step onto the ice or step down on the ice. So this takes you to the dressing rooms. Um, it's actually able to fit seven in. Uh, we had six initially, but actually have, you'll notice that the, the design, I've gone through each room and done another pass at laying the rooms out. So you'll see there's spe spe more specificity, if you will, uh, than last time where it was really a, like a block plan. Um, the bonus of having another dressing room is, and I, I wasn't able to get this finished up, but I envision that these two dressing rooms here, if we eliminate these benches and have a roll-up shutter, this becomes the opposing team's dressing room. Uh, allows them to basically use both without, without having, <coughs> excuse me, without having to go into the corridor. You'll see that a lot with uh, kind of newer dressing room design. But then, you know, nine to five, most days, um, you, you have a flexibility of having seven uh, dressing rooms. Uh, the corridor as well, so we have some exiting, uh, which we're going to need. So various levels here, kind of like an H plan, if you will. And then two double doors that take you out into the ice area. So again, this is our thermal break. Uh, our environmental separation is at that door. So cold space and, in theory, warm space. So unlike other rinks that I'm sure you've been in where you go into the, well, Lambeth is a great example. I got my kid in Lambeth Skating School, so that's on my brain right now. So I'm there a lot. Um, 
you walk into the rink and then you have to then access the doors uh, from the rink. So it's, it's cold, right? The, everything is cold about it. Um, in newer designs, you'll see this where there's a central corridor um, and a breakout there. Um, so everything is, is more tempered. <coughs> As we get further to the back end of the building, uh, the one space I didn't get a chance to fully lay out yet is, but I know there's enough space, is the Bulldogs area. And ideally it would include all of this, uh, which again, we do have space for. So a dressing room, office, potentially even a meeting room for coaches, um, laundry space, washrooms, training facility, maybe even its own separate entrance at this end. Uh, so lots of flexibility, uh, but definitely we have the space to make that work. Um, and they can either come out this door here, which is right by the home bench. And as I mentioned, opposing comes out here to the way bench. That's why we have these double doors here. Uh, so they could be sealed off during games. It just keeps the two teams separate. I'm going to go back to the lobby and then we'll go back through again. So now if you came in and let's say you're coming to watch the Bulldogs play, uh, you, know, you, you pay your ticket and uh, you can come in this way. So again, all this yellow you're at, uh, board height. So again, it's all fully accessible. Some of these chair or uh, fixed seats um, in the stands we could actually remove and have spaces here for, for accessibility as well. Um, currently in this design, I believe it's 370. We'll look at the second floor plan. I have all the metrics on there. Um, so a little bit more space, uh, seating capacity wise, but a lot more standing space. And you'll see by having a walking track, it really opens up the flexibility of where you could go uh, and watch the game. Um, no real changes to the penalty, timekeeper, they're on this side. As I mentioned, we have our, our benches on this side here. Potentially a media box in the middle as well. I've noticed that with other new rig designs. So you could have a media person center ice. There is a space and a room to pass under the stands. It's kind of hard to draw this um, because it's a three-dimensional kind of challenge, but um, you can come down uh, and then actually pass under, and then you're at this back corridor. The idea of this back corridor, it, it provides easy access to exits for the whole stands, as well as for the operators to get around the facility without having to go through the stands. Um, as well, it opens up the spaces under the stands uh, for storage. There's a lot of capacity under there which needs to be utilized. Uh, so that's why it's brown right now because that's the storage color. So lots of exiting to the south. Um, and we'll keep going across here. So most storage, I, I envision this storage as program storage for figure skating and minor hockey. Um, each kind of typically have their own zone. Uh, so this could be broken up in however we need to. We'll have an exit stair at this end because the exits have to exit out to the exterior. Uh, refrigeration, vestibule for refrigeration, have its own door um, to the exterior for any type of maintenance. Uh, you have your Zamboni or ice resurfacer room. Uh, the double door is offset from the net, so you don't have, you can set the net and leave. Um, so not having the door central. Obviously, score clock would be above this at this end. So then the people in the stands, as well as people on this end here, can see it. Uh, mechanical room and electrical room are located here. Uh, again, the, the whole item of, is this the site, is it not the site? An item that will minorly affect the design is where our services are even coming from. So you can imagine our services are coming from Lions Park Drive, which in this drawing is actually on the left side. So we need to make sure we have a place for our electrical service to come in uh, almost immediately. So again, part of the thinking is we would probably have a sprinkler uh, room, and a, a kind of electrical comms room here to start, but then everything would be home run inside the building to the back end here or vice versa. Again, once we get the engineers involved, if we do get to that level, we would get their input on the design. At the back end here, I didn't have this actually before, so I added it in with the lunchroom for the staff. I know that was mentioned when we talked with the facilities team way back, uh, Darren, whatever that was, Gemini, uh, and a washroom as well for staff, so um, it's important to have, for that they have some space. <clears throat> Another change is the referee dressing room. Uh, if you remember before, it kind of sat somewhere around here in the plan. I moved over here because um, they really should have their own exits out of the building and not have to cross paths with uh, either of the teams or the fans. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, and because we have to have another exit stair, um, we're basically at all corners of the building. Uh, this actually works quite well, so they're able to exit out um, if, you know, worst case scenario. So high level, that's kind of what we're looking at with the plan. I think it fits everything in it. So dual entrances uh, due to the site layout, um, large lobby, warm viewing areas at the end. That's uh, an NHL pad arena that hasn't changed. Uh, we've got 375, there we go, persons fixed. I think it's about probably 200 persons standing. Um, so quite a large capacity, but I think around the numbers that we've been envisioning. Central washrooms and change rooms um, to the facility. Lots of multi-purpose rooms as well as upstairs, which you'll see. Some community rooms, full court gym, central corridor for dressing rooms, separate access for the bulldogs, separate plan access and elevator and stairs. So I'll get to the upstairs now because this will all be new. And we'll maybe start um, at the elevator because that's where you come up. And I'm going to zoom in and zoom out on this thing, just because the scale of the building, the screen. So as I mentioned, you have an elevator. You come out, um, you also have the stairs that wrap the elevator. Um, underneath the stairs, by the way, um, is the elevator machine room. I didn't mention that, but on the ground floor, that would be required. You come out to basically the second floor lobby lounge area. Again, you can envision um, flexible seating in here. You can move, you can uh, set up tables here. You could... Uh, sit right up against the glass and watch the game from this end. In the middle, uh, we've purposely put a blue line room. So again, potential alcohol sales, bars, if you deemed that to happen here. Um, this is by far the best place to put it. You definitely want to have it contained as well. Um, so that's why there is uh, doors, um, dividers. Uh, whether this is enough space or too much space, that's all to be determined. Again, this is the first pass at it. Because we have a bar here uh, and, and because it's central to where people are coming up, it made sense to put the washrooms upstairs as well. Um, all the washrooms, by the way, um, are, um, they don't have doors, so you're able to pass through with the walls. Um, so again, they're all accessible as well. Um, at the back end here, I have another janitor room, some storage room, and the multi-purpose room. There is some space here uh, to potentially have some more offices. I, I kind of wanted to leave that open to you guys to think about. Or they could be rentable spaces as well. A um, lot of flexibility upstairs um, as we're designing. Space-wise, what would be an equivalent? For the multi-purpose room? Yeah. Uh, let's see, so that's 28 feet. This would be, it's probably close to 35 by, uh, that bay would be 20, 20 by 35-ish. So each of, them? each of them, yes, yeah. So whether there's three of them, whether it's one of them, there's two of them, I mean, this is all very high level. Um, again, with our designs, we're trying to work from macro to micro. So we're trying to get the initial things correct and then develop them, refine them, and then talk with you guys um, about this. Sorry, I was just asking to try and envision like what, totally understand. what yeah. kind of programming could yeah. go in there. Yeah. Um, anyway, so then as we kind of continue around, zoom out, obviously we have a walking track. So it's a dual lane walking track all the way around the outside uh, of the space. Um, the benefit of having that, um, the way it's designed right now, it's all on the warm side of the building. It's not in the cold space like it is in Dorchester uh, Arena. Um, but obviously there's a cost to do that, so you actually have to seal up that, that zone. Um, but again, there's, there's many benefits to having that as well. And it also opens up all the viewing and potential um, around the stands. Again, we only have seating on one side of the facility currently. Um, so it actually, yeah, provides more flexibility for, for, for big games. We get into the um, seating design. So as I mentioned, I increased the seating uh, to get it to basically the haunch here of where the board turn. Um, so I was able to increase each end bank a little bit more. So I think initially they had 65 at the end. Now they had 96 at both ends. So as I mentioned, we're at three, we're actually 377. Uh, fixed seats. And that's without removing any for barrier free. Again, very, very high level ideas at this point. Uh, so five sections. Uh, there will have to be, because you are above the 
Um, penalty box, the timekeeper, we would have to look at guards and glass uh, kind of in the center section. Um, and, but you'd have to do that either way if it was the home team and the away team. There's, there's a divider there, as you know. There is standing room as well. Um, so this level of the standing area when you come to the top of the stands is not at the level of the second floor. It's at its own level. You can see the amount of stairs we need to get up the second level. If you wanted the standing level to be at the second floor level, what that would do, it actually pushes the seating out to right about there somewhere. So much more seated capacity, but also much uh, bigger building. We have to push the building out to the south in order to make that happen. So our envision was you have multi-levels. I actually have a rudimentary section cut through here already, which I didn't include, which I should have, but um, it, it actually shows how the different viewing heights would work. So you can stand up here and you can easily see well over a person standing here. And then obviously you can see, see over all the people that are seated uh, in front of you um, as you go down. So we have a stair at each end, again, for exiting plus access to the second floor. So you're able to be in the stands area and then come up here to use the washrooms if you need to, or you can go down to use the washrooms because it is at kind of its own level. As you come around the walking track, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we have the exit stairs at both ends. I'll just zoom out a bit. Um, there is space um, to use. Um, you can see kind of in the um, spaces where the track bends. Um, I didn't populate that with anything at the moment. Uh, I just wanted to again, keep it very high level for everybody. So potentially another janitor room at this end would be good to again provide uh, that kind of level of cleaning, especially with the amount of stands here. I get it close and then have something over for the blue line room, the washrooms at that end. Um, the roof uh, area, so this is where the dressing rooms are currently. So we haven't expanded the second floor to be the same footprint as the ground floor, um, unless you tell me to. Um, there's a huge amount of square footage here that you could put other multi-purpose rooms and then you can envision people using the walking track as the corridor to get to those rooms. It's definitely a possibility. For now, I, I figured I'd just keep it very straightforward and just go with a standard kind of a rectangular form um, and, and, and leave that as a roof um, basically below. So right here below would be the multi-purpose room and you're entering the building right about here for reference. Would it, would it, would it take much more uh, work to design that to allow for a second level in the future? So construct the first level so that it can receive a second level in 10 years or whatever. Say the community grows to a point where there's, you know, four or five service clubs that need space or whatever it could be. So short answer, yes. Um, it has to be thought of and it has to be designed up front. Um, so more than likely, the... Uh, structural system of the building, uh, because we're talking about a second floor, it's gonna be a precast slab. So what you would do in that situation is the roof would actually be a precast slab as well with the roofing membrane on top of it. So a good example of that is Gateway Church on Sarnia Road in London. We did phase one and then we designed uh, the, um, we actually designed it with two stories and then costs came into play as they do and we cut it off uh, but we designed and we um, for a second floor and we had the stub work as well for the structural columns so we could add a floor later. You can't add a floor onto a roof, but you can add a floor onto something that's designed as a floor. Uh, again, it just takes foresight and you actually have to build it into the design. So that's my longer answer. <laughs> of course it's possible. <laughs> uh, and you'll see in the back end, I kind of cut the roof off as well, or not cut the roof off, um, didn't expand the... Uh, space we could we could have more spaces, but I figured we're gonna need some roof above the refrigeration There's gonna be a whole bunch of venting and exhaust and rooftop units um, So those need to live somewhere as well and same with this space uh, more than likely We would design if we're gonna design a portion of it Maybe for programming and another portion for a roof that's again possible because you need to put your uh, HVAC system somewhere usually it's on the roof yeah. So how do you ideas for this one walking track viewing area? Um, lots of seating and standing room, very flexible, 
Um, the stair connections between the floors, as I mentioned, we have the blue line room slash bar, uh, washrooms, multi-purpose rooms, and elevator. Again, very high level, lots of flexibility of what we could do with the space. Um, whether it's on this site again, or if it's a different site, I think there's comparables to what you're kind of seeing here. So Mike, I'm assuming that um, delineation between the cold space and the warm space in the second level is glass. I'm assuming? Uh, yes, parts of it would be for sure. And the question is how much, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah I'm, thinking, I'm thinking from the first slide where we talked about the life cycle and the operations, because <laughs> that's a ton of glass to maintain. For sure, uh, yeah. Right, so. are, you, are you talking around the ring? Uh, I'm talking about around the walking track. So the, the walking track is in the warm space. Yes. So that would uh, that could be glass, eight foot glass panels all the way around, right? But so on the ring side, not the, the other side. It would be right here. Yes. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah. So right here where it says viewing area, I draw a triple line. In theory, that's glass. Every, everywhere I've drawn, there's glass, there is glass. So yes, there's a lot of glass. Uh, I guess, can you guys live with have it not sealed off. Well, you, you could. I think the enjoyment is, uh, I think the usage would change if it's not um, separated. Right. right. That's, that's, I think that's the reason that you got the um, comments that you did at the open house with regards to the walking track. Yeah. Um, we have people who, if you want to walk in the cold, they'd walk outside. We, we have recently opened up a walking program inside the Caradoc Community Center. There's what, Darren, 15 or 20 people who regularly come out there to walk around the gym. Yep. Uh, so it's, um, I can see that just expanding that greatly. So the other way to look at it is we don't have the walking track go around the rink. We have the walking track go around the gym, which is also possible. Which we've designed as well, <laughs> not not for you today, but another project. Yeah. So the possibilities are out there. I'm just trying to get your brains open to what is space D, because again, that what we're trying to do is define the scope, right, and come to a consensus of what you want to have, so then that a budget can be created based off of that, right? Is trying to narrow the list down. So, so two questions that I had. Yeah. Uh, so uh, one was about the standing room count. Uh, are you only counting people standing in the viewing areas or are you counting people standing potentially all the way around the walking track? All the way around, including downstairs. Yeah, because as I mentioned, I mean, I'll go to the other the last slide because it has both together. Because I, I see that as you've laid it out, that that's an immense amount of standing room. Correct. Which I, I like. Yeah. That, yeah. But it could be too much. Again, it's, this is the first pass at it, right? So when you're upstairs, obviously they're doing all the glass viewing area here, all the way around this edge. You could wrap all the way around. At some point, to Rob's point, we're gonna have solid walls. Maybe this whole back end is all solid and you have your score clock kind of happening at this end. Um, anywhere up here as well, if there's glass, you could stand and view. There's the standing actually in the cold space, so at the top of the landing, which all has a bar top, potentially a bar top height, uh, a trick rail, if you will. Um, so that's all upstairs and then downstairs, we have all of this viewing area in the lobby here as you wrap around. We have a little bit of standing space as well as you come through um, into the cold zone. Um, again, parents could be standing really anywhere, um, but maybe this is not used when the, the Bulldogs are playing, right? So you don't allow public through that door. That's why I had it separated there. Um, and obviously all the seating itself um, throughout the the stands. So again, you have a lot of capacity. So second question, I remember, um, I want to say it was in Listowel, uh, where they were saying that the uh, hockey teams were using the walking track uh, for dry land workouts, yeah. Uh, yeah. but interrupting the uh, figure skaters because they were making so much noise. So the concept of keeping the walking track in a warm environment to stop that. Yes. Uh, but in seeing those three large corners in particular, do you see potential for uh, off-season uh, space to use for different kinds of programming? 
So what do you mean off season? Like so not in the winter, like so not when there's ice in? Yeah. Or or at any time, I guess. Like is, is there an option to run Well I'm I'm picturing you're gonna see those corners, they're gonna be the areas where the teams do their uh, their warm up, mm -hmm. uh, their dry land before the hockey games. Uh, which is actually ideal because in facilities where you don't have that, they're on the track mm -hmm. doing it. Uh, so if you have that space, the the kids would be off the track in the corner doing their stretches, their jumping jacks, and, and that sort of stuff. The challenge that we'll have is maintaining the the sound because uh, they'll want to bring their beatboxes, whatever the hell they call them nowadays, <laughs> Bluetooth speakers, um, uh, and play music really loud. But that just becomes a management uh, issue. No different than we have today. And storage for stuff like uh, spare pieces of board and hockey nets. Was there sufficient storage in this plan for that kind of stuff? Yeah, so that's all of that. Um, <clears throat> all the brown spaces basically within the facility are storage. And you got to remember, it's hard to show it, but um, yeah, underneath all of these stands is a huge amount of potential storage, yeah. right? Because you're really not going to use that space for programming really, because of the potential headroom. Um, so it makes sense to use any square footage you have for something, and ideally that's where you would put a lot of your storage. Yeah. Because you could have uh, off-season storage for stuff that you would do in the facility when ice is not in as well. you got to imagine that, right? This is not always going to be a rink, because you're not doing this uh, 365, right? The rink turns into some other type of space. It's not right. Yeah. So I'll just give you an overview, and then we'll kind of show, talk about next steps. So, yeah, sorry, there's some other questions. Oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I, I like I like the looks of it. Um, two things. Uh, yeah, just that that's fine there. Um, you you talk about the score scoreboard at the end on a building like this. Is what's prohibitive about putting a scoreboard at center ice? Nothing? <laughs> I see you're shrugging your shoulders. Great idea. Okay. <laughs> uh, second question. Uh, we visited, Rob and I visited an arena in Lisbon. Yeah. yeah. Um, so one of the guys there said, uh, you know, uh, although I don't think we're at the right site for this building, but there is, if it was where, where we currently uh, are talking about, uh, we got um, soccer fields out to the side. So on a building like this, do you know of anyone where they put washrooms off the side of the building that are accessible from outside only? Maybe, maybe it's both ways, but the idea that it would service whatever, wherever we have it, it would service the, the baseball diamond, the soccer diamond, the cricket pitch. Yes, I do. So Wellesley. So that's definitely something that is a doable on this plan. Yeah, well, the the one I referenced was well, Wellesley as well. They that they have that. They have two okay. two exterior access washrooms. Whether they have sports facilities next to it or not, you have to. It's it's it's, it's very much. If it's fundamental in the design to have it, we can add it. You have the space to do that. Yes. Right. Yeah. Just gotta find the right one. I think Mike's comment earlier that. What he's showing you gives you the basis of what can be done. If, if it's not on this site, the drawing can be manipulated to, and, and still keep the main components of what we have here. Agreed, right? right? Yeah. So, um, from an operations perspective, the only thing that, the only comment that I'm going to make is, uh, can we build it tomorrow? Um, and an indoor dumping pit for the yeah. extra surfacer. That's, the only item that I've uh, noticed that wasn't identified, so. Eric, do you have any questions? Not really any questions about the design. I, I like the design. I think it flows well. Um, I just, I'm listening to all the conversation and all the little things we're looking at changing now. And then also thinking about the public-private partnership we're working on. We don't know if the site's going to change. Uh, the only thought that keeps running through my mind is I think we're at a good place to park it and just see if that's what council's wish is for us to just park it here until we get some of those balls figured out where we're going to put it. But that's the one thing. I don't really have any questions about the layout. Uh, there's a few things that could change. There's the glass and the operational costs and how much staff it's going to take. We don't know any of those things yet. Um, so just overall, just from uh, an operations and, and standpoint, I think we're at a good point now. 
Of what? If, if I may, Chair. And I think you asked it. Um, to get to that level one uh, class A costing. Class C. Class, class C. C costing. Okay, we start seeing work our way down. Um, to get to the class C, between where we are now and to, do, to finish up to the class C, so council has an idea of what the ask potentially could be, the big question is, how much money are we throwing at the project to move it to that point? Are we talking 100K? Are we talking 50K? Even roughly, like, I, I mean, you shook your head at 100,000, which I'm happy about. Those of you going, not even close. That could be, that's um, way more, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think, I, I, honestly, I think that's the question, right? So I, I like the Class C. It's a great idea. Yeah. If, if we were, like, if we do that, that's wonderful. It helps council out tremendously. Roughly, people say, well, what, what are you spending to get to there from, from this point? Roughly, not to be held to it. Yeah, so I will get you the number. I'm not going to answer the number here, but I will give, you, give Rob the number. I can give it to you guys. Again, we're pretty open, and I just got to calculate the rates. I guess the question is, how many more meetings are we going to have? And are we going to get feedback from your all end? Because I, I need to firm up the scope in order to go towards the Class C costing. I, and I actually have a list of things that remain, and I'm happy to share with you what is left. Because all you've seen so far are plans, right? Yeah. 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 And to that, we've brought up uh, whether we want glass around the rocking, walking track, whether there's too much glass, we want extra, maybe we want outdoor bathrooms. Like, yeah. There's maybe we want more, a uh, second floor that can be expanded. Like there's, like, we've thrown out a bunch of stuff there, which is going to change that costing by a million dollars or more. Well, it, it, minus, it, it yes. may, but I mean, if we're talking of a $30 million project, like, I guess all of those little incidentals, it might be a million, but if we're talking a $30 million project, the million becomes... Uh, and I'm with you on that point. The point is just how much are we going to spend and how much time do we... So I'm just thinking, with what he's presented today, if he, if he worked that plan right there, what, 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 what is that building worth? So, Greg, no. yeah, I mean, we're, we're going to face those questions no matter what we do. Yeah, I, I, I realize that. That's just kind of where I'm, I'm yeah. trying to figure out, like, what so, we want to So, do. Mike, because I think we cut you off, uh, what what else was there for you to ask us? And, and then I guess that we would need a, a list of items to identify, to solidify for you what you're actually doing a Class C costing for. And I, and I think at... Uh, before we actually do that, uh, we're probably asking some of those questions uh, to council. Uh, Maybe wrong on that, but uh, if if I may, yeah, I'm. I'm. It's not very often I agree with the deputy mayor. Not too often. Um, <laughs> but I, I kind of look at the drawing that uh, has been provided and. You know, although I'm the one that raised glass all the way around, glass is the higher end. So if the price comes back at $40 million, which it's not going to come back at $40 million, we know that glass is the high end finish. So when we go to the class B costing, that's when we pull back on the glass and say, okay, look, we're not going to do... 10 foot panels, we're going to do six foot panels and there'll be uh, a stub wall up three feet off the ground and, and so on, right? So that's when we can start making the adjustments to reduce the overall uh, finish schedule, which is going to reduce your overall costs. I think it's important that we get pricing on, on what we want, what we think is going to be the nicest facility and then try to pull back a little bit on your costs. Um, because if you don't ask, you're not gonna know, right? If, if uh, 10 foot panels of glass is only an extra $500,000 on a $30 million building, I'd probably go with the 10 foot panels of glass. But if it's a million dollars on, or 1.5 million, maybe I'm gonna reduce those 10 foot panels down to six. You, all my rationale. So I tend to agree with what the mayor, the deputy mayor is leaning towards. 
Um, all of those other little things like indoor dumping pits, uh, outside washrooms, like I, I'm looking at the drawing and I know where you can put the outside washroom right now. It's, right? it's not a lot of time associated with that uh, or expense, right? Because I, we're, we're, I mean, we're still, the urban boundary mm -hmm. design, like that's the biggest one, for me, right? But, but Which could take years. Oh, uh, let's hold on. <laughs> let's, you know, try to get a feel. Is, is this truly the piece of property we want to put, whatever this building's worth? Is this truly the piece of property or, or, or is there a better option out there for us? And, and then those changes will, will morph. But I, I, for me, because I, I, I want to keep whatever cost we're putting next in front of us, I'd like mm -hmm. to keep that to a minimum and get, you know, what are we talking? Are, yeah. We've talked 26 million, Steve, and then all of a sudden, you know, I work it up to 30 million. Well, if it's 26, it's probably 30, but reality, it could be 20. So I, what's that building worth? And then when we go to, to budget or whatever, we have an idea. Because ultimately, we, we got a whole bunch of those $30 million projects we're going to be putting on a piece of paper saying first, second, third, and I have no so idea. So let's hear is. what other items that, because you still have items that you want to talk to us about, right? I do, yeah. So I'll finish up. This is all very good conversation. Um, let me just go over it very, very quickly. So, schematic design overview. So this is what we have so far. So we got two floors. It's a multi-season, multi-purpose rec center. It has an ice rink. It's got gymnasium courts. It's got community rooms. It's got a walking track. It's got exterior field space. So it's a rec center. That's our seating, standing capacity. Um, it could be 300 people, actually, quite frankly, once you, depending on how much class we have. That's all to be determined. Parking, we've got 250 spaces. It's about the max we could fit. Um, I haven't put any barrier-free spaces on there, so that number would come up, <coughs> because it would take up more. There's your areas, if you're curious. So basically I took all the stats. I'm just trying to jam all the stats on the one page for you, just so you guys can find them. So this is the question back to you, is, is really, is, has the scope, the what and the where been captured? That's what we're talking about. We're not talking about the other things. We want to get to costs. And so I would push back and say, hey, is there any changes? So you guys can take this away. I don't think, again, having bi-weekly meetings with clients through Zoom is, it expedites the process because we're making decisions. We're working on the project. Having a meeting every month and doing a presentation like this is time consuming, quite frankly. Um, if we want to expedite this, if we want to get the schematic design sorted in order to get to costing, we need to be moving faster. I can, <clears throat> I don't have a problem if, if Mike, if you were to send us the the presentation and the drawings and that and then we reconvene not including you yeah the, this committee reconvene with our thoughts and changes and suggestions then mike and i and Derek can have a meeting and i can convey those changes to mike and then we can move forward if that's the, if the committee is accepting of that that way we can keep the ball rolling because we're all extremely busy i don't need more night meetings um, I don't know about you or anybody else, but <laughs> we have lots of them. Um, so if the committee's okay with, with you know, the committee sitting down, going through the drawings, Darren and I making notes, and then Mike, uh, Darren and myself and Mike reconvene and make the changes, and then and we'll send them out to all of you for the, yeah, okay, you've captured what I've asked for, and then we can give Mike his marching orders, if that's the will of the committee. So... Just to that point, though, the the other way you could do it, there is a class D cost. I didn't mention it, but it's, it's typically it's not as used as much. But the class D is very, very high, high, high level. You're talking about square footage costs. So um, we're at ninety, what are we at? Ninety six thousand square feet times it by a number of a metric of a project that's recent, and there's your budget. And we can do it that way too, right? I don't oh. think that's helpful. No. How accurate is that? Yeah. It's not. It's no. not. No, we don't want to do that. That's why I didn't put it on the drawing. <laughs> I didn't, didn't want to talk about it. So, so, but it depends on how fast you guys want to move. That is just to get a number on the budget so you guys can talk about so this as a council. That's where the 36 million came from. Correct. Right. Yeah. Sorry. That's not that answer so you're trying to refine the 36 million? Yes. Okay, perfect. Ask them the answer. That's great. So if there's any change, that's, that's the any changes part. Because again, it's we're, as an architect, we. We love feedback. We love, this is what we do. We work with people, right? I want your feedback. If I'm only getting feedback, 
not really that much, quite frankly, in a meeting. Like we talked about, I'm making notes here and I don't have many notes and changes. Okay. I'd rather you take the information, because there's a lot of information, yes. digest it, yes. think about it, and then like provide the information to Rob and he can filter it down to me. That would make the most sense. Because so far I've been just kind of like presenting stuff. I haven't been really been getting a lot of feedback, right? But is it not, like I, I, I think operationally Rob and, and uh, Darren need to take a look at it. And because and, I couldn't tell you if it works or not as an arena. You already mentioned one thing that seems to be critical. So I can, from my point of view, I can go right to, to Mike, right? You, that, that um, uh, heated. Indoor, indoor dumping pit. Yeah, yes, please. thank you. Um, you know, the outdoor bathrooms, yes, but it depends where, where the building ends up. I see what, what you've said in, in the class C is the, the, the scope, and, like the what and the where. I don't. The where, to me, in my mind, is still extremely fuzzy. I'm not sure. Uh, so that's why I say, you know, I, I'm good with the, with the indoor uh, dumping pit. Um, the bathrooms, add them, don't add them. Honestly, it's not that much money. Them because the, the likelihood is if, if even if we chose a different site, we're probably... We're going to build them. Yeah, we're but does it make that big of a difference on a $30 million build? No. So, again, I mean, if he wants to put... I think put them in there so we can demonstrate to the public. And there you go. Give me a price on that. Yeah. And then I think too with the uh, the center center score uh, thing because I think you're going to have a lot of people standing in the warm area at any point in buildings. So yeah. having, having the uh, scoreboard at one end, and all of a sudden, a lot of people won't, might not be able to see it. Yeah. So to the to the point. So the, the drawing is not asking them for the drawings to be perfect before we go for costing. That's just not how it works. In reality. So whether you want to make sure you didn't have to redesign roof trusses or something to support it. No, because the structural engineer is not involved yet. We have a high level idea of what we're doing for the building, but they're not involved. We haven't brought them in because that's going to have a lot more cost to the project. Yeah. You guys want to be comfortable with your scope and the budget before we proceed into that, and that could be years down the road if it's a different site. To answer the site question though quickly because it's on top of the brain. What we do for costing is we would have a building cost and then we'd have a site cost. So to your point, if this is not the right site, which maybe it's not, maybe it is, who knows, at least you can have a lump sum of here's the building, here's the site, and then you guys have a general idea, right? Because the site could change, right? Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. That's, yeah. that's what we need to get council moving forward. Yeah. And then we'll know what direction we're taking at council. Yes. And, then, and then we'll know, we'll be able to actually give answers to people in the community. So, uh, if I may, building off of uh, the Deputy Mayor's comment about Darren and myself reviewing the drawings, are we saying that, that if Darren and I sit down and, and go through the drawings and, and get on that technical kind of like indoor dumping pit, uh, mm -hmm. maybe we want an additional janitor's closet halfway down the hallway, versus coming to this committee and getting your input? You're I comfortable with Darren and I doing those technical stuff? I think the number one comment we heard on the tours was that uh, every mistake that was made was an operational mistake, not a, a design mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, we want to have a good operating arena because that's going to help that's right. In in the enjoyment of everybody using it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, like the simple things like the janitors, we heard that how many times? Oh my gosh. That Everything. there was no janitor yep. uh, closet mm -hmm. near the lobby where, where people make a mess. Yeah. And and so again that's affecting people's enjoyment because if somebody vomits in the lobby, now it's sitting in there and now potentially making other people sick. Uh, yeah. I just and wanted to make easy, sure easy, that easy for staff. Yeah. yeah. Like, no, so, I like, I, I'm not expecting you to add a million dollars worth of stuff, but I, I think, yeah, I mean, that is insignificant to me on a class C. So what we'd be looking at then is there was additional meeting spaces and stuff upstairs that yeah. had square footage. Uh, you know, do we see a value uh, in those? And I, I guess even then I'd, I'd want to go back and have uh, staff comment on them. What can they see happening in those kinds of spaces? Can they be revenue generating, or, or are they just square footage we're building to have it sit there, you know, ninety nine percent of the time empty? 
So, quick, quick comments about those uh, meeting rooms upstairs. They become tournament offices for hockey tournaments, for basketball tournaments. Uh, they become, uh, maybe it becomes a rental space for, say all of a sudden there's a, um, uh, the Optimus Club needs a, uh, an office. And we rent it out at an annual rental rate. Um, no different than what we've done in the Gemini with the pro shop and the skating club and Meyer hockey, that kind of stuff. So I do see them valuable. Uh, if they're not rented out, they'll be used by uh, our own department from a programming perspective, whether it's an arts program or a crafts program or uh, whatever it could be. So I do see them viable. I, I think not building them it will be a detriment. Um, because if you don't build them, you won't have them. If you have them, at least you have the ability to market them. I'm just saying that if, if we had staff comments on those spaces, then when it comes to justifying the price tag, mm. we can say, well, these spaces are important because, <clears throat> you know, we see yeah. seniors programming or like, mm -hmm. a, you know, Euchre Wednesday afternoon being used in there, then at least you can start to justify the cost of the space. So, so that you can. So, so are we well, saying, Chair, are we asking then Mike to take a portion? Because he was saying he needs some HVAC rooftop uh, area over top of the... Um... No, he set that aside already. Oh, okay. Yeah. He's, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying from the, the, the community spaces, the non-operational spaces, that I would like to see some... Yep. Yeah. So, like next to the gymnasium on the second floor, yeah. uh, you know, what what can they see being used in those spaces given the the rough size that? Well, you're talking those two purple rooms yeah. that are already yeah. there. That's yeah. what you're. Yeah. Sorry, I thought you were speaking about the large white area to no. the right hand side. Yes. So, so just for a uh, space context, those two rooms would be very similar to this size space here. Oh, there we go. So Thank you. to your point with regards to uh, justification, uh, it won't just be myself and Darren who are looking at this drawing. I'll have Darren, myself, and our program team sitting in uh, when we review them. I'm comfortable, thanks. Yeah, I'm comfortable with the process we've talked about. My only concern is that um, we don't know how many time or hours it's going to take to get to that class seat. We've been told we're going to get that number forward. Are we prepared to make the decision to go ahead without knowing what that cost is going to be? Well, we can do that without any further work from anyone. Anyway, so, right? Yeah, well, I'm just, uh, yeah. and that's just a question for the committee. Do we want to uh, say this is the direction we want to do pending approval of the cost? Uh, like, I, I, if we go ahead and we say maybe it takes two, or, and I'm going to throw something out there. Say maybe it takes two months and it's, uh, he has got to get some architects or whatever involved beyond him to figure it out and we're eighty thousand dollars to get to this cost but we're also looking at the public private partnership so mike said he was going to get the cost to rob right uh yeah so i can so I, can, I, can, I can clarify because maybe i can teach you story so you've asked for how much longer is it going to take and how much more costs uh, you asked me that to get to the class c so i can provide that estimate uh because we're, we're we have an hourly rate like with yeah. the municipality so that's it doesn't change like yes it's, it's, it's just a number of hours and correct it's, it's, so we can do that because that gets you to the point of the class c and then once we have the class c results we can then give you an estimate of what all the re remaining fees and hourly uh um sorry remaining fees and how long it would take for us plus all the consultant team as I well i think craig's question is 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 are you even willing to spend the money to get to the class c i, I see okay yeah, yeah. depending on what we're looking at um so let's wait for the... We don't know what that number is. No, but he said, you said you were going to get that to Rob, right? Yeah. So yeah. we'll wait. Yeah, so, yeah. so I'm not saying, like, I, I like the plan that we have. Uh, I think we're on the right path. But I think with so many different options and still looking at the public-private thing, we should see what that number is. And if it's only, like, thousand or 40000 or 50000 it's probably good to go for it. But if it comes back at 200000 to get this number and we don't know if we're going to go ahead or not, and people are going to say, why don't you build sidewalks or... So we'll, we'll probably reconvene as a committee when that price tag comes in, but in the meantime, we can look at the drawings and make, and make our suggestions. Yeah. I think that's the best way to go. Yeah. yeah, so what I can do as well is I can give you an estimate. I just talk, I'll just talk to the cost consultant and say, hey, how long will it take you to do costing on this uh, project? 
So I believe it was three weeks for the first costing for the fire hall. This is a bigger building. It might be four weeks to get their work done. And that's by the time I, I you know, get all the information to them. Um, so next steps, because again, I, I knew this was, the conversation was going to come up, so I put it on the screen. So um, really, the committee to confirm building area programming and scope of the rec center. Um, you know, provide your comments. We love comments. And if it's going to come through Rob and Darren, that's great. And Paul, I assume. That's awesome. Um, again, we're very open. We want to work with all of you. Um, the other stuff, because like it's not just plans for a Class C costing. Um, you could just have that for a Class D. We actually have to figure out other elements. I've made a list of elements that are included, and this affects obviously the amount of hours, the question, right? That's why it's hesitant for me to state, state what we need to do. So we have to figure this thing out really in 3D in massing. So I think we've got a plan that we're if we're starting to fit everything that you want, like your wish list, but does it actually work when you actually put it into 3D? Do we need to move things around before we fall into in love with the plan? Mm -hmm. These are things that we test. We use it to test our projects out. I haven't got to that stage yet. And so that's like heights and massing and volumes. I have general ideas of where things are because I had to figure out how high the stairs are gonna be, for instance. So there's sections and elevations of materials. Glazings, openings, do we have any canopies on the exterior of the building? All of those have not been determined yet. And all of those really should be determined before you go for a Class C costing because it will affect the costs if you don't have it on the drawings. Um, preliminary structural systems, again, I mentioned we have a good idea what we're doing there, but also the building systems itself. So uh, to Councillor McGuire's point about HVAC systems, we like to give a general idea of where those things are going to be, right? We have to allocate space for those whether it's very, very high level at this point. Um, so there is a bunch of work that has to occur to get to the Class C costing, to your point. So these are just, again, just trying to um, explain to you about how the process works. It's not just like, oh, we got the plans, great, let's go. It's not as simple as that. I wish it was. So, <laughs> so this goes back to uh, Councilor Wilsey's uh, comments with regards to, you know, what's it going to cost? So all of that, will Mike will be able to figure out and give me a price on what it would take for him to get through all of this. His comment about 3D and, and the massing is an important one as we were going through the fire hall development, uh, the, different, the different roof elevations that we looked at to determine whether or not it actually fit in the neighborhood, uh, right? Because the, an architect may come in and say he's in love with this, this pitch, but when, when we as staff start looking at it from a resident's perspective, we're going, eh, not so much, don't care what the architect thinks, he may fall in love with it, but from a perspective of a resident nearby, what are they thinking? So it, it gives us that visual of, you know, what's the building gonna look like? Is it gonna fit within the neighborhood? So those steps are important steps before we get to a point of actually going out to cost because if what we uh, come up with in a 3D massing, um, the residents uh, or staff go, that, that's just not worth it, then that's going to change your end result. So it's important that we go through all of the steps and not shortcut the steps to get to where we need to be. That's Yeah, and with all that work, we don't know how long it's going to be. Like I've done projects with clients where the 3D portion in offices, they take three months of engineers working together with clients to get it done. And I'm not saying that's going to take this long this time because we're closer, but we don't know. And it, it's taking longer in the system that we're currently set up with, right? Oh, meeting sure. once a month and having, right, where like the fire hall, we were meeting, well, we were meeting, uh, the group would meet every other week and Mike and I were meeting on time. On occasion weekly um, to move things along yeah. um, so if we were if we streamlined a little bit where it's the recreation team uh, looking at the drawing that will speed up that process but what will take the time is really waiting to find out what the price is <coughs> to move forward to that class C when we reconvene so okay. mm -hmm. do you want me to share what we what the deliverable was for Class C for the fire hall. You guys all know the project. I'm sure that's okay, right? Yeah? Because then it give you an idea of like the amount of work that goes into it. Um, so let me just put it up on the screen. Uh, here we go. So um, obviously existing site, existing fire station, right? We went through the whole exercise of where this thing could be. Um, 
site plan. So we basically have that, right? We have a good idea what we're doing on the site, right? So we're in good shape there, uh, comparing it to you know, the, the arena project, rec recreation center project. Floor plans, um, very high level. Um, really, a, we're very close again. We're talking about wa exterior washrooms at this point, so that, that's a good sign, right? <laughs> Uh, but operationally, Rob and Darren and his team need to look at it and happy to sit down with them anytime to do that. So floor plans, we want to obviously provide all the floor plans. Uh, roof plan as well, um, have a general idea of what we're doing for there. Um, materials, elevation, so these are actually, if you look at the building from straight on, it's all the faces of the building, if you will. So where are the windows? What type of material is it? This actually, if, you, if I zoom in on it, it tells you about the systems of the walls, what are the walls made of them. So for instance, it's concrete block walls for this project with brick on the outside and some metal siding, pretty straightforward materials. What's the roof made out of? All of this information, again, this goes to the consultant uh, who then has to provide costs for each specific piece of the building in each uh, uh, construction division, right? So the more information I can provide them, the better. Um, again, the 3D aspect, um, we do a lot of 3D work because, again, it's a tool for us to test ideas, as Rob mentioned. So we tested, I think, eight or nine different roof lines and masslings on this building. So peaked and sloped and slope it this way, slope it that way. Um, we want to go through that exercise so that, again, we are making informed decisions um, and ideally bringing you all in, in. So I think there's another meeting or so uh, you know, where we talk about 3D um, as, a, as a committee um, because we don't know yet. We haven't tested the, the concepts out. And what does it look like in context? Because your neighbors matter. Um, you know, we're building something for the community, in the community. So um, how big is this thing going to look against your neighbors? We, we actually end up modeling, you know, the context as well, as you can see here. So this gives you a, a very high level um, idea of what we produce for Class C costing. Um, and then class B costing, as I mentioned, is much more information. Oops, I'm, there we go. Um, much more information, including all the engineering drawings. So once you do a class B costing, you really want to be comfortable with your results of the class C. That's why we stage it this way. So you're not spending all this money up front to get the drawings 50% done to realize that you're over budget. That'd be insane. We don't do that. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. questions? No, and I think we have our directions, so just to make sure I'm clear, we're going to get a copy of the floor plans as they've been presented. Uh, we will make comment to staff. Staff will then look at it from an operational perspective. Uh, even some of those things that you talked about, like canopies, I know there's liability issues if you don't put canopies, so really we can leave those up to staff as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, they're, they have a cost, but they're not the, the do all and end all of costs. Agreed. And I think Mike alluded to when we get to the 3D, we want to come back to this committee so you can see what it's going to physically look like. Because you may come in and say, whoa, no, 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 no. Like, we don't like that. You know, say there's a line of windows. I think we're getting ahead of ourselves talking about 3D right now because we haven't even heard about the cost. To well, yeah, but, but, but 3D is all part of that whole before we go to Class C costing. Yeah. Uh, so right. I'm just, for, for now, I'm just saying that the next steps are for us to get the drawings, mm -hmm. for us to go through and make any comments, and for mm -hmm. you to look at it yep. from an operational perspective, uh, both from programming and from just running a rink. Yep. And then when we're done that, We'll take a look at where we are in the budget process and, and meeting time and and then see where we're going. In the meantime, Mike will send me a quote. Yes. Getting to the yes. class C. Yeah. So Yeah, yeah, I think it's, it's okay. as long as we wait until that class C I think we owe that to the public and yes. to see I, I agree. To yep. see what it's gonna get to get to a class C and then we make our decision once we have that. Yeah. We just don't go any further than that at this moment, I think, is, is probably... Just because we're so fuzzy on location, right? Yeah, yeah. on location yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. and even ability to... to Mike, do you have anything else to, to bring to us? No? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, inquiries or comments by members? Mike, do you have anything? No, good meeting. Thanks, Chair. No. Yeah. Greg? No, I'm good. 
Sammy? No, that was a very good meeting. All right, so I am going to bring up one thing that I have had uh, uh, heard of rumors going around that uh, this is never going to get built because uh, because of the arena that's been approved uh, on the other side of Kamoka. Again, I'm going to point back to that decision by council. We're going to replace a rink for a rink. How that rink looks uh, is is what we're we're differentiating about. Uh, I think that given the level of ice time that's used at the Tri-Township Arena, irregardless of whether uh, that rink is built or not, we're still going to require that ice time. Uh, so the question of whether or not we're going to build a rink has nothing to do with what happens in Kamoka. Uh, so if you're hearing something like that, yes, the cost is causing us to pause in, in the midst of, of whatever other uh, large-scale projects we have going on in the community, but what's happening in Middlesex Center is nothing to do with our decision-making process. I just wanted to make that clear for the public if anybody's uh, paying attention and asking questions. Uh, so our next meeting, uh, we, we're not gonna trim that date yet because we gotta have time for uh, that information to take place. And so uh, I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Made by Greg, seconded by Sandy. In favor, Mike? Yep. Awesome. Thank you much. Thank you. Have a great night. Is the next meeting then at the call of the chair? Yes.